go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Ruth. It's, uh, it's a great love story. It's the Old Testament book. And we see this Moabite girl, her name is Ruth, who's trust, trust in the God of Israel. It's a love story of a Gentile girl named Ruth who marries a Jewish man. And we see that God is working in all the events. It's a story of love and redemption. And we began last week, and we started seeing it. As we got the brief background. We got the overview of the book. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to see Naomi and Ruth who are going to leave the land of Moab and come back to Bethlehem. As we look this morning, let me give you some key issues to think about, okay? The first one is decisions. We're going to see a number of decisions this morning, decisions that Naomi makes, that Ruth makes, that Orpha makes. And I want you to think about this. We realize the decisions that we make, that we make some, some decisions that we make affect us right now. Some decisions we make affect us for all time. So we'll talk about decisions. Second, a commitment. We see that Ruth says, she commits to Naomi. She says, wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you lodge, you lodge. You, where your people are my, my people. Your God is my God. Do we keep our commitments? When we say, I'm going to do this, do we do it? The third thing, there's blessing. We realize that everything we have comes from God. And even though Naomi is saying, I went out full and I came back empty, she's not empty. She's got the blessings of God, and we'll see it as we go through it, and we realize that everything we have comes from God. And then last but not least is God's sovereignty. We'll see it as we go through, because he's working in every event, and we'll see it even in this chapter, especially in the next chapter, and we're going to see that we have to trust God in everything that goes on. So there's so much, and may we see the, the love story of redemption as we study this book. Well, start. You know, if you could put a sign on the back of most people in the United States, it would be, I'm not responsible. That'd be the sign. We live in a society where everybody wants to say it's somebody else's fault if something happens. I mean, a person buys coffee and spills it on themselves and then blames the person who sold them the coffee. Uh, the, the whole idea, idea of disability has gone up five times in the last five years. Our people in our nation project, project an attitude that, listen, when things go wrong, somebody else is to the blame. But here's what we need to think about. We need to think about that we are responsible for the choices and decisions that we make. We are accountable when you make a choice. And second, the decisions that we make and the choices that we choose make a difference. There are consequences. And when I say consequences, I don't always necessarily mean it bad. When you make a choice or a decision, there are things that go along with that. Some choices and decisions we make have eternal aspects to them. As we see our passage this morning, we're going to see some decisions. Naomi just says, I think I'm going to leave Moab and go back to Bethlehem. We see Orpha and Ruth, and they've, they've got to decide. Are they going to go back with Naomi? And Naomi doesn't even really want them to go. Naomi says, no, I don't think it would be a good idea if you all go. And so Orpha goes, okay, I think I'll probably stay. But, but Ruth says, no, 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 I'm going with you. These decisions that are made in chapter 1 affect them for the rest of their lives. And we realize the decisions we make. Sometimes the decisions we make affect us the rest of our lives. That's why the decisions that we make need to go back to the Word of God. That's the key. Well, as we continue this morning, we're going to see Naomi and Ruth. They're going to leave the land of Moab. They're going to come back to Israel. They're going to come back to the city of Bethlehem. And there's so much in this passage. Let me, let me just give you the quick, quick overview of what we saw last week so you have the running start into, into the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, of course, gives us a story of love and redemption. Ruth and Boaz fall in love. Boaz redeems both Naomi and Ruth, and we'll talk more about that if you haven't understand it. And this is really a study and a story of redemption, because our redemption is a love story. It is God that so loved the world that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to purchase us, to redeem us, to die for us. Now, in this book, there are three main people, and we talked about it last week, but there's Naomi, who is the mother-in-law to Ruth. She's Jewish. She's married to a man named Elimelech, and they move to, to they leave and go to Moab, and Elimelech dies. That's Naomi. She has two sons. Her name means sweet or honey. She had looked to God's word. She said, I went out of Bethlehem full. I come back empty. It was really wrong. She went out empty, and she came back full. She just didn't see it. And then there's Ruth. Ruth is a Gentile. She's from Moab. I hope you had the time last week to go back to Genesis. I told you if you would, go read Genesis 19 to see where the Moabites came from. And she is a descendant. She's a Moabite. And she marries Naomi's son. And she's got some decisions to make. And she becomes a believer in the God of Israel. See, she grew up in Moab. And they had a God called Chemesh. 
And Chemesh was a god that you that had a fire burning all the time, and oftentimes they took their children and threw their children into the fire to burn their children up to appease Chemesh. That's what she came out of. But she trusted in the God of Israel. And then the third person is Boaz. He's the hero. He's a relative of Naomi. He's wealthy. He's a landowner. He's got everything going for him. He's a man of influence and power. And he sees an issue with Ruth and Naomi. And he falls in love. And he becomes the redeemer. And we'll talk more about it. In fact, two aspects about this man. He's called a kinsman redeemer. We're going to go more detail in a minute. But there was a privilege and responsibility of being a redeemer. But there's a second part about this man. He's a picture of Jesus Christ because what he did for Ra Naomi and Ruth was redeem them and save them and protect them. He's a foreshadow of Jesus Christ who comes as our kinsman redeemer, as the one who dies for us and redeems us and takes care of us. So what we're going to see is Naomi, a mother-in-law, Jewish, who turns to the God's word. We see Ruth, who is a Gentile, who trusts in the God of Israel. And we see Boaz, the foreshadow of Jesus Christ, who's the kinsman redeemer. Now, let me remind you something. Before we get into this, there were, there were some things that are Jewish, old Jewish aspects of, of Jewish customs and law and all that, that if you don't understand, you won't understand the book. So three things. Number one, the, the idea of a kinsman redeemer. In that day and time, if you were a family and you got yourself in trouble, or you lost your land, or you had to sell yourself into slavery, anything could happen to you. If you, you had a redeemer, you had a kinsman, you had a relative, if they had the money, they could come buy you back and purchase you. They were called the kinsman redeemer. And so sometimes a family got into trouble, and a relative who had money would come and say, I'm going to buy my family, purchase them, and pull them out. They were called a kinsman redeemer. Boaz is a kinsman redeemer in this book. There's a second thing called the law of gleaning. We talked about it last week. Poor people, they didn't have land. Poor people didn't have government stuff. The poor people in Israel's time, if you were poor, you could go to somebody else's property while they're gleaning or while they're harvesting, and you could, you could just follow their workers around, and whatever they dropped, you got to get yourself. In fact, it was the law that said you do not glean the corners of your property. So poor people could go to the corners of somebody else's property, and if it was grapes, they could take grapes. If it was something else, they could take something else. That was like a welfare system. as a way that God provided for poor people called the law of gleaning. And then the third thing was called the leveret law of marriage. We talked about it last week. But if you were a guy, and then you had an older brother, let's say you got an older brother, and he marries someone, and we talked about it last week. If your older brother married somebody, you want to check this girl out. Because if he were to die without any children, and you weren't married yet, you had the responsibility called the Leverett Law of Marriage to marry your brother's wife and raise up children after his name. Because he didn't have any children. It's called the Leverett Law of Marriage. And we talked last week that if your brother married somebody, you, you, you either wanted to say to him, please don't ever die, or please die. You know, it could be. So it, you never know. But that is, that is a key thing, and it's in this book. And we'll see it as we go through it. Let me remind you, look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. There came about the days when the judges ruled and the judges governed. There was this famine in the land, famine in the land of Israel. There was this man in Bethlehem, and he had two sons, and they left Judah and went to Moab. He had a wife and two sons. The, name, the man's name was Elimelech, which means my God is king. And his name was, uh, wife's name was Naomi, which means sweetness or honey. And it, they had two sons, Malon and Chilon. And they, they left and they went to Moab. And what they were going to do is just go. It was a famine in the land, most likely the time of Gideon. And they left to go live outside of Israel. They said, what we're going to do is just go live there for a little while. And then we'll come back when the famine is over. And it said that they got there. That what happened? Verse 3, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with two sons. Now, this is really sad. She's called a widow. Now, in under, under the, the Jewish way and even under the Greek way, a widow was someone who had lost her husband, but she still had family. A widow, indeed, was someone who lost her husband and didn't have any family. She's not a widow, indeed, yet. Because she has some family. She has two boys, two sons. So she goes in Moab, and Elimelech dies, and we don't know what, what happened to him. But then, look what happened. Verse 4, she had her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Orphan, the other was Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. They weren't supposed to marry outside of the Jewish culture. They weren't supposed to. But they married Moabite women. And let me just tell you the truth. For Naomi, it was probably 
an embarrassment that her sons, Jewish boys, married these non-Jewish women. They really weren't supposed to do that. But they'd been living in the world. They'd been living out in Moab. And then look what happened. Verse 5. Then Malon and Kylon also died, and the woman was bereaved of her two children and her husband. This is where we ended last week. And what happened is, all of a sudden, you have this Jewish woman, Naomi, who now has no husband, and she has no sons. She has nobody to take care of her, because in that culture, a woman had to have a husband or sons, some way to take care of her, and she didn't have a way. And all she's really got are these two daughters-in-law, and they're not even Jewish. They're Gentiles. They're Moabites. And, and to be honest, Moabites, they weren't looked on very well. I mean, if you think the Philistines weren't looked on very well, Moabites weren't looked on very well because of the background. And so as we look at what's about to happen, these four things, and I thought we talked about them, there's going to be some decisions to be made. What about the daughters-in-law? What about Naomi? We're going to see the result of sin. We're going to see that they live in the world. There's emptiness. There's bitterness. We'll talk about it in a minute. We're going to see the blessings that's really from God, and then we're going to see the commitment, the idea of keeping our word. So look what happens. Look at verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. Now, I want you to look at this verse. She gets up. This is Naomi. And we have no idea what her age is. She could be in her early 40s. If you picture her as a real old woman, listen, she's married and she's got two sons that were old enough to be married, but sons old enough to be married could be 16, 17, 18 years old. Sometimes the women that were married were 14 and 15 years old. So Ruth and Orpha could be as young as 20 years old. Now, they've been in the land for 10 years, so they're probably like 25, 26 years old. So she's probably 45 and she's a widow, and she has nothing. She decides, I've heard, I've heard through the grapevine that God has visited our people, and there's food back in Bethlehem. They, they left because there wasn't any food. They've heard their food, so they're going to go back. So it says, she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. Now, I want you to notice the, the word there. I think we got it. Lord. If you notice in your Bible it says that she had heard that the Lord, it's all capitals. And just notice that. I want to teach you something. That I don't usually do this. I usually do it in classes. But whenever you look in the, in, in the Old Testament and you see the word Lord and it's all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's the Hebrew word YHWH, which is the personal name of God. So it says she had heard that the personal God had visited his people. Sometimes when you look in the Old Testament and you'll see a capital L and little O-R-D, that's the word Adonai. It's not the personal name, but it means master. It, it means God, but it, it's not exactly the same word. So she heard that the Lord had visited his people. The word visit there implies a blessing. It doesn't mean that God just showed up in Israel. It means that he brought food back. It means he, he began to bless them again. And most likely people believe this was sometime after Gideon and those kind of things. And, and, and and, and I want to show you this. I think we got a map. Just to show you, we, we looked at it last week. Is there a map next? Yeah. They had been living in Bethlehem. Moab is in the southern part. There's the Edomites and the Moabites and the Ammonites. Ammonites lived here. Moabites lived here. And the Edomites lived way down there. They left, went across this way. They wouldn't go this way. It's way, way far around because it's, it's Dead Sea area. This is really, the further you go here, the, Beersheba is very south. It's called the Sinai area. It's nothing there. So they wouldn't make the trip and go this way to Moab. They'd go across where Jordan is, uh, where, uh, go across the Jordan River, they'd go where Jericho is, and then they would come down this way. So they've been here for 10 years. They're deciding that they're going to go back, that they're going to leave and go back to Bethlehem. That's the plan. Now, remember it says that she heard that God had blessed, you know, had visited the people and given them food. God's blessing them. And we have to realize that God blesses all of us, everything that we have, everything. James says every gift and everything comes from above. Everything that we have is from God. And, and we, we, how do we respond to the blessings of God? So often we actually, we, we, don't, we just take them for granted sometimes when we should be saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me another day. You know, when you wake up, what you really ought to say, thank you, Lord, for another day. Because he doesn't have to give you another day. You don't have to live another day. I have, a, I have a, a little book that I do my quiet times in every day, and I have a part that I write, 
And I'm telling you the truth. I write every day, thank you, Lord, for another day. I write that every day. Because there is no guarantee that you get another day. And I love every day. So thank you, Lord, for another day, especially Sundays. I like Sundays a lot. Anyway, so look what happened. She arose with her daughters-in-law that they might leave, they might return from the land of Moab. She heard in the land of Moab that the Lord, the personal God, had visited his people and given them food. So they're on the way. Now watch what happens. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. Now it looks like they're all going. Now, what we can't tell, and, and you, can, uh, I don't, you can just leave that up there for a minute if you want to. They're going, but you can't tell, are they all going? It says she's leaving and her two daughters-in-law with them. Are, are they all going to go back to Bethlehem? That's sort of what it looks like. Or could it be that the two daughter-in-laws are going to say, hey, we'll get you up to the border and we'll let you cross on over and then we're going to go back home. We don't, we don't know. We don't know enough. But look what it says. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. She says to the girls, why don't you go back home? Go back to your mother's house. Go back to your family. You've, you've been with me for 10 years. You married my sons. They're dead. I think it's best if you go back home. She says, may the Lord deal kindly with you. Now, why would she want them to go home? Well, think about it. Could it be that she thought that was best for them? Because... Listen, what's a, what's a non-Jewish widow, because they're widows now, what's a non-Jewish widow going to have when she comes to Bethlehem? Nothing. And so she may say, it'd be better for you if you just go back with your family. Appreciate all you've done. There's a second thing. She may be embarrassed. Oh, I'm sorry, leave it on that one. She may be embarrassed because if she goes back to Bethlehem with two Gentile daughters-in-laws, what's everybody going to know? that her sons married Gentile Moabite women. So she says, you know, it might be better if you go home. But notice her words. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and me. The word kindly there is a very special word. It's the word hesed in the, Greek, in the Hebrew, and it means a loyal love. It means an unchanging love. May the Lord continue to love you as you have loved us. Listen, there's a truth that some people are confused about, and it is this. God's love never changes. When you are living for God and serving Him and on fire, He loves you to the maximum. When you are living in sin and going the opposite way, He loves you to the maximum. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and have eternal life, He loves you to the maximum. If you're an unbeliever and live in sin, and uh, He loves you to the maximum. His love doesn't change for people. He loves us with an unconditional, unchanging love. You can't make God love you more than He already loves you. And you can't make Him love you less. She says, may, may you... May, may the Lord show his chesed love to you. We can never earn God's love. We can never make him love us more. So watch what she says, and this is great. She said, may the Lord grant that you find rest each in the house of her husband. And she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. She says, listen, when you go back home to your mama, what's going to happen is you're going to get another husband. They'll find, there's a, there, I'm sure there's some nice Moabite men that you can meet, and, uh, and, and may you find rest in the house of your husband, because you're a widow. You got nothing. Maybe when you go back, you can find a good Moabite man, and then you can find rest, because he'll take care of you, and you got it made. So her implication is, go back to your home and marry somebody else and be taken care of, because I can't help you. I'm a widow. You're a widow. I got nothing. You got nothing. Your best thing is to go back home. And look what it says. She kissed them. And they lifted up their voices and wept. Can you imagine just looking out on this road, and there's three women there, and they're all hugging and crying and talking to each other, and you're going, what is going on over there? Because that's what's going on. And they said to her, no, no, we, we will surely return with you to your people. Whoa, that's a big statement. We've decided we will go with you. We'll go back, we'll go to Bethlehem with you. Look what she says. But Naomi said, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Let me stop there for a second. Why should you go with me? Think about it. 
Next slide, I think. There's no advantage, humanly speaking, of why she should go. Why they should go. Look, think about it. I think the next slide. There's there's no husband. There's really no chance of... Listen, do you think two Moabite women coming into Bethlehem that, that there are going to be men lining up to say, oh, I want to marry a Moabite woman? That's not going to happen. And, and they don't have any husbands, and they're in poverty. Nobody, there's nobody to take care of them, and they're foreigners. So when you come back... Listen, the very best thing for you to do is go back home. And see, sometimes, humanly speaking, what we do doesn't add up. Because what you said is... I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I have eternal life, and I want my life to count for him. And I'll go anywhere and do anything. And people say, what? What, what about a job? What about a really good job? And I, I'm just wherever God wants me to go. I always think of Jim Elliott. Mo many of you don't know Jim Elliott. There's a book called Through Grace of Splendor. Jim Elliott was a missionary in the early 50s. Jim Elliott went to Wheaton College. He was a wrestler, a football player. He was president of the student body. He was one of the smartest guys. He had, had like a four-point grade point average. When he got ready to graduate from college, they said, you can have any job anywhere you want in the United States. You are amazing. And he said, I'm going to South America to try to reach a people called the Alka Indians. I'm giving my life in ministry. And people said, you are foolish. Look what you're giving up here. And he said, he is no fool who, gi who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And he went to South America, and he and four others were put to death, killed by the Indians that they talked to about Christ. And their wives came in and led them to Christ. It's a great story. People say, what a wasted life. That wasn't a wasted life. An entire people group came to know Jesus Christ as Savior because of the lives of Jimmy Elliot and four other men. Humanly speaking, they say, what a wasted life, and we say through God, what a great life. Going back to Israel, uh, that's not, that's, I don't think you should do that. There's no advantage in that. But look what Naomi says. And Naomi said, return, verse 11, Return, my daughters, why should you go with me? And then look what she says. Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, I'm too old to have a husband. If I've said I should have old, if I should even have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? What is she talking about? Do you remember the Leverett Law of Marriage? Let me throw something up to you. Deuteronomy, watch the next slide. If a brother lives together and one of them dies and he has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to some strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as a wife and perform the duties of a husband's brother to her. Go on to the next slide, I think. And it shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out from Israel. The Leverett Law of Marriage, she says to those girls, listen, I'm, I'm too old to have any more boys. See, what's going to happen, what's supposed to happen is when, you're, when your husband's died, my, my sons, my next sons should take over. But I don't have any more sons, and I'm too old. And even if today I got married today and had a husband and then had children, would you wait till they grow up before you could be married? You're going to wait 20 years for me to find another husband, have a kid, hopefully it's a son, and raise them up and then marry you? She says, this is, it won't work. Look at verse 13. Would you therefore wait until they're grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it's harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She's saying, it's harder. I'm too old. I can't do this. It, it's harder for me because you guys still have a chance. You can go back and find some Moabite men, and they can marry you. But the chances of me finding a man and getting married and raising up kids, to, it's just not going to happen. She says, if I could get married and have sons, would you wait till they're old enough to marry? You can see Orpha going, hmm, I never really thought of it that way. <laughs> and you can see Ruth going, I don't think I care. I don't, I don't care. I don't care. And some people say, good gracious, there's no hope here. But let me tell you something. It's better to be with God in a hopeless situation than without God in an abundant land there's nothing hopeless with God. It's better to have nothing with Jesus Christ than to have everything without Christ. She says, it's so hard for me. The hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. I lost my husband. I lost my sons. I've lost everything. I've got nothing. 
And now here it is. A time of decision. What's going to happen? And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her. See, and I want you to understand, this isn't just about go back and find a man. Look what this is about. It's a matter of worship. Look at here. Go to the next slide. If you stay, if you stay in Moab, you go back to Moab and the people and the gods of Moab. But if you go, you know, you're going to go with Naomi and to the God of Israel. And the real decision here is not finding a man. The real decision is who do you worship? See, Orpha is going to go back to her gods. And Ruth is going to the true God of Israel. That's going to be the difference. The dis and decisions are important, both now and in the future. Think about it. Think about decisions. Look at this. There are some decisions that will shape the rest of your life. Think about this one. Next slide. The decision to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, my hope and prayer is that every one of you in this room, you have already trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, and you have eternal life. You have eternal life the moment you trusted in Him. But there may be some, and that is the biggest decision, because here you are, the decision is, do I trust Jesus Christ and have eternal life? Or do I reject Jesus Christ? And the Bible says if you reject Jesus Christ, you have the second death, you're separated forever. The most important decision you'll ever make is to put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. Is the second decision. The decision to serve and live for Christ. All of those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, you're saved and saved forever and it costs you absolutely nothing. But a big decision as a Christian is, am I going to live for Christ or not? And that's going to shape the, that's going to shape eternity for you. Not where you'll spend eternity, but how you will spend eternity. Amazing decisions. Look what happened. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Here's the thing. Orpha kissed, that means that's a goodbye kiss. But Ruth said, I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. So look at 15, and we'll go very quickly. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people. And what? And her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. She says, she's gone on back to her people and her God's. Listen, she didn't believe the same way. She, she needs to go back to Chemesh. She needs to go back to her people. But Ruth says, no, no, no. No, no, no. I, you, you don't understand. No. See, the real decision here is not just poverty and Jews and all that, but it's the worship of either Chemosh or Yahweh. And that's why our decision is so big. Because our decision is either Jesus Christ and eternal life or rejection of Jesus Christ and eternal separation. So look what she says. Go back. Why would she want Ruth to go back? Maybe being in 10 years' environment there, she didn't really care anymore. Or maybe she's so embarrassed that, she's a gen that she'd be a Gentile that she didn't want to do that. Or maybe she was just testing her to see if she was sincere. But I want you to see what Ruth says. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge, and your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God, and where you die, I will die, and I will be reared, and, and thus may the Lord, look at that all capitals, the personal name of God, she calls God by his personal name, must by the Lord do to me, and worse if anything but death parts you and me. Look what she says. Where you go, I'll go. I'm going to Israel. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. That's Bethlehem. That's in poverty. Your people, we my people, that's Jews. She's going to be an outcast. But your God is my God, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, personal name of God. She says, I'm going with you because I believe in the God of Israel, the true God. Big decision. She trusted, I think, next slide, she trusted in the God of Israel. She says, I would rather have poverty and widowhood and be with Naomi and with the God of Israel than to be rich and married in Moab with the God Chemash. So look what happened. She said, where you die, I'll die, and I'll be buried, and thus the Lord will do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts us. And so when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. She said, if you're going to go, you're going to go. If you're going to go. Now let me ask you something. 
What happens when they get there? And it's pretty bad. Ruth could say, you know, I, uh, I didn't really think it's going to be this bad. I mean, you know, I kind of got pretty emotional out there when I was going wherever you go, I'll go, and you know, you know. But so this isn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. If you ever made a commitment and then it wasn't exactly like you thought it was going to be, and you start saying, "I think I made it," I think I'd like to get out of this commitment. Do you keep your word or not? Do you keep your word only when it's convenient or not? See, this is the key, one of the keys. Ruth says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your God is my God. I'm going to live there and die with you regardless what happens. And when we make a decision and we decide we're going to do something, we need to keep our word and do what we say. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now think of what you do. These two girls, Oprah, went back to Moab and to her gods and she has never heard from again. Ruth went to Bethlehem with her God, Yahweh. And she's in the lineage of the Savior of the world. So look what happened. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they'd come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? They came back and the word stirred there means like bees. There was all kind of talk. Now, why are the women saying, is this Naomi? You know why? Because the men aren't there. You know where the men are? They're out in the fields. They're out working. The women are there, and they come into town, and all the women go, Look, it's, it's Naomi. Isn't it, is that Naomi? They haven't seen her in how long? How long has she been gone? Ten years. And so they begin to say, Is this Naomi? And look what Naomi says. Naomi said, Don't call me Naomi. Call me Myra, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. They said, Call me Myra. The name Myra means bitter. She said, Don't call me sweet. Call me bitter. I'm bitter. Things have not been good. God has dealt with me in bitterness. She's bitter. There's no joy. There's emptiness. This is what's wrong. And notice what she says. The Almighty. That's another name for God. That's El Shaddai. That means the powerful one. She says the powerful one has been bitter with me. Now let me ask you a question. Humanly speaking, has everything gone wrong for her? They were in a famine. They leave. She lost her husband. She lost her sons. One girl went back. She's got this Moabite girl with her that she's going to have to take care of and figure out what to do. She has no money. She has no people. She has nothing. Humanly speaking, it's not very good, is it? She doesn't realize that God is fixing to bless her beyond what she could even imagine. And just because what it looks like humanly, God is working behind everything. And let me tell you, in your life, you look at life and you go, I tell you, I just lived out of an ordinary old life. No, you don't. God is working in you and working things beyond what you could ask or imagine. There are things that you might do or say that's going to have an impact on somebody else that may go on for years and you don't even know it. So never think you live an ordinary life. You live the life as a representative of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You represent him. Your life has eternal impact. So just remember that. So she comes back, and she says, Oh, the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord brought me back empty. She went out empty. The reason they left, they didn't have anything. She says, Bro, bro the Lord brought me back empty. No, he didn't bring her back empty. He brought back the great-grandmother of the king of Israel who's going to be in the lineage of the Messiah and Savior of the world. She said, Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me sweet, since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So it looks really bad, doesn't it? But look what happens. So Naomi returned with her, with her, and with her Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. That's that's about April or May, and it's time that they're beginning to to get. They're going to get the crops and have the first fruits and start having a good time because this is when they're actually getting their stuff. They've been, they've been planted everything, and now it's time to harvest. It's symbolic of new life because these two women are about to start a new life. What have we seen? Decisions are made. Orphan Lo goes back to Moab, and her gods, Ruth, goes to Israel with the God of Israel. They return to Bethlehem. The women are all stirred up. Here comes Naomi, and you might hear him say, Who is that with, who is that with Naomi? Who's that girl with Naomi? Where are Naomi's sons? Where's Naomi's husband? And who is this girl with her? We'll see what happens. Applications. The decisions that we make affect our lives. The decisions that we make that 
or maybe temporal sometimes, but some have eternal results. And I want you to think about, first of all, the decision to trust in Christ as Savior. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior right where you're sitting right now, you can believe that Jesus died for you and paid for your sins, that he offers you the gift of eternal life, and this very moment you can trust in him at decision to believe in Christ for eternal life, and that exact moment you have eternal life and you will be saved forever. I hope and pray if you've never trusted Christ right now, you will trust him. There's a second decision, and that is the decision to live for Jesus Christ. For all of us who have trusted in Christ, what are we going to do with our lives while we're on this earth? Are we going to live for Christ or are we going to live for ourselves? Are we just going to go through the motions or are our lives going to count for Christ? Remember, the decisions that we make have consequences. Be not deceived, God is mocked. What a man sows, that shall he what? Also reap. He sows to the flesh, reaps to the flesh corruption. You sow to the Spirit, you reap from the Spirit life. Second, realize that all blessings come from God. They do. And when they're, they've been in... Then Moab, and now they're coming back to Bethlehem, and what they don't realize, what they don't realize it, but God's blessing them. They just hadn't seen it yet. Third, trust God in the events of our lives, and, and He is sovereign and He's in control. We're going to see it next week, but God is working all these events. And because we've been saying, She has what? Nobody. That's not true. That's what we think. That's what we think, but it's not true. She has somebody. We just don't know who it is yet. And in your life, you say, I got nothing. You got more than you think. You just don't know it yet. The last thing, keep our commitments. Listen, if you say you're going to do it, do it. You know, when you say, I'll help there, do that. Let's be men and women of character. Let's keep our word. Let's follow through with our commitments. So as we trust God's word, as we seek to live for him, realizing the decisions we make, make on the word of God, and uh, make an impact for Jesus Christ. Let's pray.